Hello and welcome to Accounting TV. We're going to be bringing you a programme highlighting the main issues facing people working in the accounting profession. Joining me is uh, Guy Loveday, my business partner, and he'll be talking through the various issues that you are all facing. Um, so Guy, one of the first issues to talk about, the point at which you become audit exempt, is, is changing, is that right? Uh, well, kind of, yeah. The, periodically, the uh, small company audit exemption thresholds do change. Um, as everyone knows, they're, they're specified in terms of turnover and gross assets and the number of employees. In 2013, we are looking to see uh, threshold changes for turnover where it's likely to go up to 10 million euros, about 8 million pounds. But at the moment, the turnover threshold is 6.5 million pounds and the gross asset uh, threshold is 3.26 million pounds. Um, for a number of years, to become exempt from audit, a small eligible company has to meet both of those financial criteria. From accounting periods ending on or after the 1st of October 2012, however, a company will only have to meet two of the three criteria for determining small companies. So if they meet, for example, one of those financial criteria, plus they have no more than 50 employees, then that will be enough. As long as they meet two of the three criteria in the current and previous year, they will then qualify for audit exemption. Okay, so let me check out understanding this properly. So there's a number of employees test, and then there's the gross assets test, and also the turnover test. Yes, yeah. Um, and as it's up until October 2012, um, we had to pass all three, or, or uh, uh, two uh, of the three, or? Until, until accounting periods ending on or after 1st of October 2012, you had to meet the two financial criteria, that's turnover so gross and gross asset. assets. But then from after that, it's gonna be a case of simply passing just any one two, of them. Any two of the three. Any two of the three. And what the government is saying is that's about 36,000 extra companies will become exempt from audit. Something that I, I would like to ask as somebody who doesn't really get this. Um, obviously the audit is, is a legal document and it's something that we have to have done for, for, for larger companies. Yeah. But if you're quite a small company and you want to have some sort of belief and credibility in your accounts, is an audit not sometimes something that we should be encouraging people to, to have anyway? Is it well, worth the process? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And some, some small companies who are entitled to audit exemption choose to have an audit for those very reasons. Credibility in their accounts. Maybe some will perceive they need uh, audited accounts to, to um, perhaps tender for contracts, government contracts, that type of thing. Um, others perhaps will feel that having an audit would make it easier for banks to lend them money. Uh, and what we tend to find is if a well-known firm of accountants, and I don't mean necessarily a national name, but perhaps a, a well-known local firm of accountants, is involved in preparing accounts, then that seems to give credibility. As far as the bank's concerned, as far as the taxman's concerned, you know, there is comfort to be attached to the fact that this well-known firm has prepared the accounts for them, mm. even though they're not passing an opinion on those accounts. You know, they will often issue an accountant's report that will draw attention to the fact that they've prepared the accounts from the information and the explanations given. So the accountant's report really serves the purpose with a lot of bankings, uh, you know, banking institutions and what have you, and that's normally enough? Yeah. Okay. Um, the other issue that's changing the, to do with this audit exemption is to do with subsidiary companies. Yes. Uh, this is changing. Yes, it is changing. Again, it's, it's, it's a result of the government going back and looking at the original directive that brought in audit exemption back in the early 90s. The first thing they discovered is that we weren't applying the thresholds in the way the EU intended, and that's what resulted in these extra small companies obtaining exemption now. Second thing they realized is that we were offered by the EU the opportunity for virtually all subsidiaries to be exempt from audit, and we didn't take up the offer. The Germans did, uh, the Dutch did, but very few other member states bothered. But because we're now all trying to save money, and of course it's money and cutting costs that's behind the small company mm. audit exemption changes, the government said, well, hey, why don't we bring in audit exemption for subsidiaries as well and save money for those businesses and help them to survive the downturn and help them to um, divert resources into um, expansion as we come out of the recession. And so, and so how will the rule be applied then for, for the subsidiaries? Well, virtually every subsidiary will be able to take advantage of audit exemption. Um, not subsidiaries that are themselves listed companies or banks or insurance companies, but they can be subsidiaries of uh, listed companies, for example. Um, so they can obtain audit exemption, but there are three hurdles that they'll need to, to clear. The first hurdle is they do need to get the unanimous approval of their members. 
So if they're 100% owned subsidiaries, that's going to be straightforward. But if they're other than 100% owned, they're going to be dealing with minority shareholders. Uncle Jim, who's got two shares in the company, and says, I want an audit. And we say to him, but Jim, do you even know what an audit is? No, he says, but I still want one. Mm. Well, then that's fine. He owns the company uh, and he can have an audit if he wants. So all we could do in that situation is perhaps buy him out. You can buy out dissenting minorities, of course, under the Companies Act. But unless the company can get that unanimous approval of its members and reobtain it every year to continue to be exempt, then they will have to have an audit. Assuming they get that agreement, then they will have to file a letter each year along with their audit exempt accounts showing that they have got this unanimous approval. Yeah. Okay. But that's only the first hurdle. Yeah. The other two? The second hurdle is that although they themselves can be exempt from having an audit, they must be included in a set of consolidated accounts somewhere further up the chain that is subject to audit. Um, and those consolidated accounts must be prepared either here in the UK or more widely within the EU, or even slightly more widely within the European economic area. So you could have like a Liechtenstein parent, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and those accounts must then be prepared either under international standards or in accordance with the EU directives. So if we were looking at a company that had a South African parent, uh, an American parent, an Indian parent, who produced consolidated accounts that were subject to audit, well, that wouldn't be good enough. Um, they would have to uh, perhaps set up an intermediate parent company within the EEA, have them produce consolidated accounts and have those audited. Now, if they have to do that, that's going to be significant extra cost and they'll have to weigh up the cost of saving, um, having to have statutory audits for however many subsidiaries versus the cost of preparing those consolidated accounts. But presumably, if you're going to have a consolidated group of accounts anyway, you're going to look through the top anyway to get down to some of the nitty gritty. So you're still going to be doing quite a lot of testing on the subsidiary, even if the, the subsidiary itself doesn't require a full audit. Well, yes, yes, it's, it's not... Uh, this is maybe not a problem for those who are responsible for the accounts of the subsidiary, but whoever is responsible for those consolidated accounts is going to have a new problem now, which is passing an audit opinion on a set of consolidated accounts where most of the companies in, those, uh, in that consolidation are not subject to audit. Mm. So they will have to now consider performing audit work themselves or commissioning others to do it with respect to those subsidiary companies. But what the government would argue is, whatever they choose to do, it'll be a lot less than a full statutory audit for each of those individual companies. Mm. And hence, there will still be significant cost savings. And remember, cost savings is the whole point. Cost savings is what it's all about. And the third test? The third hurdle to clear is perhaps in some ways the most difficult one. Originally, the government was saying we want the parent company to guarantee the borrowings of this audit exempt subsidiary. After consultation, they've decided the parent company must guarantee all of the liabilities of the subsidiary. Uh, this guarantee will take the form of a letter, uh, and guess what? The letter will have to be filed with the company's house along with the accounts of the audit exempt company. Uh, it'll be a letter that has to be renewed each year, and it's a letter that will focus on the liabilities of the subsidiary at the end of each year, and it will guarantee those liabilities until such time as those liabilities are discharged. Mm. To, move, to move on to a slightly different topic, um, Obviously, we had UK GAP, and we were all kind of happy with UK GAP. Then we moved on to international standards. And the thing that I'm, I'll say it, and hopefully you can explain it, we're now going to move back to UK GAP at the time that UK GAP is abolished. Yes, yes. Yeah, this is a kind of an add-on in, in the same statutory instrument, and it's dealt with all the audit exemption changes. Um, ever since 2005, it's been possible for any company to choose to follow IFRS instead of UK GAP. Only listed companies have to follow IFRS, and only then in their consolidated accounts. But anyone else can choose to. Now, frankly, you'd be mad to choose to, because the cost of producing accounts under full-blown IFRS, the only form of IFRS that's lawful, um, is prohibitive. You know, it is very, very expensive. But nevertheless, anyone can make that switch. And many companies have. The problem is, having switched to IFRS, Prior to the current change, it was almost impossible to switch back. It was a one-way street. You couldn't switch back to UK GAP except in very limited circumstances. And hence, companies were stuck incurring significant costs preparing their accounts. So the government, in their determination to cut costs, are saying to these companies, we will allow you to switch back to UK GAP 
as long as you haven't previously switched back to UK GAAP within the, a five-year period, um, even though, as you rightly say, Giles, UK GAAP, as we know it, is effectively being phased out and will cease to exist from 1st of January 2015. Right. So, so as far as our viewers are concerned, then, then what should they be looking out for at the moment? This is, I mean, it, should, we be, should we be moving back? Should we be staying where we are? Well, and m the reason companies flip-flop between the two regimes, potentially, government believe, is for perceived tax savings. And there would potentially be tax savings for a company switching from one jurisdiction to another. But I would have thought in the vast majority of cases, those tax savings would be massively outweighed by the cost of having to produce accounts under IFRS. But to stop the flip-flopping, that's why they're saying, if you've already done it, if you've already switched back to UK GAAP in the previous five years, you can't switch back again. Right. But I can't believe there will be any companies who've already switched back and then gone to IFRS again and are now trying to switch for the second time. So it's just a way of saving money. But even if they can do it for just two years or three years, the money they will save over those two or three years would certainly be worthwhile. But then indeed they will have to change again to move to the new regime, which is also based on IFRS, but a much simpler form of IFRS, where it won't be as expensive or time consuming to prepare the accounts. So for the vast majority, it's a, it's a no-brainer. It's, it's something that they should be doing. Moving Absolutely. away from moving away from earnings and back to profit and all that sort of thing. Yes, exactly. It, so. Moving away from a, an Americanized form of accounting, which is the international standards, to good traditional British terminology associated with UK GAAP. Yeah. Okay. Well, sticking with this idea of UK GAAP, then we're going to have FRSs, more FRSs than I've ever seen in my life. We were talking before we started recording. I think. When I was working in practice, we got up to about FRS 17, I think. Uh, and I was very concerned when you said to me, well, we need to talk about FRS 102 when we meet. <laughs> I was thinking, I've missed a lot of stuff in, while I've been uh, just working in tax. But actually, the good news is we got to about 30 and then stopped. We got as far as FRS 30, uh, which was issued a few years ago. Uh, that's a standard on heritage assets. Heritage assets are assets held for their contribution to knowledge and culture. Okay. So very few clients would hold such assets. The church might have them galleries, museums, but most businesses wouldn't. Um, and yeah, we're jumping now from FRS 30 to FRS 100, rapidly then followed by 101 and 102. Um, I suppose they could just as easily have started again at number one, accounting standard one, two and three, but they just decided to stick with the FRS framework and jump to 100. Yeah. But from what you're saying, they are as fundamental as SAT 1 and 2 were. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. FRS 100 to 102 will replace mainstream UK GAAP. Every SSAP, every FRS, every task force abstract that we currently have will be withdrawn. They have been withdrawn. They have already been withdrawn with effect from accounting periods commencing on or after the 1st of January 2015. Yes. Wow. And so should we be saying, well, I'll worry about that in December 2014 then? Or, or what should we be doing? If, we, well, if I'm in practice today, what do I need to be watching out for? Okay, well, we need to worry about it a, lot, a long time before 1st of January 2015, because when we do the accounts under this new regime for the first time, we're going to have to do comparatives as well. And we're going to have to explain why those comparatives are different from the figures that we would have reported for the previous year, say the year to December 2014. The reasons they'll be different is because there are many accounting differences between UK GAAP, mainstream UK GAAP, let's call it, and this, well, it's a second tier, a simplified second tier of IFRS that we're moving to, that we're going to call FRS 102. FRS 102 is effectively an international standard with a, um, a thin veneer of UK GAAP on top. What we'll be doing is using the international standard in conjunction with Companies Act formats. We have to do this to comply with the uh, EU accounting directives, but we're also doing it so that the accounts look more familiar to accountants and those who use accounts. Uh, so they will have a, a cosmetic feel of UK GAAP, but behind the scenes, underneath the veneer, there will be many accounting differences, presentational differences and disclosure differences. And every accountant who's going to be involved preparing or auditing those accounts is going to have to become familiar with those changes. And so they have basically between now and producing that first set of accounts with comparatives to update themselves by reading the standards, by attending courses, by talking to others who are involved in, in, in these areas uh, and getting up to speed. 
And so it affects potentially every company in the UK. I mean, we're going to talk well, in a moment about the very, very smallest companies. Yes. But apart from that, it could affect literally every company. Yes. Well, it wouldn't affect listed companies in their consolidated accounts because they're already following full-blown IFRS and will continue to do so. But it's quite likely that most listed company parents, plus all the subsidiaries, would currently just be using UK GAAP. Well, they won't be able to use UK GAAP from 1st of Jan 2015. Mm -hmm. Nobody who is currently using traditional UK GAAP will be able to use it. So all those companies will have to switch, and they would most likely switch to, to although there are options, they will most likely switch to this FRS 102, the second tier of IFRS with the veneer uh, of UK GAAP. Smaller companies currently following the Frizzy, they may be given a little bit more time um, so that we can think what will happen to them. But the Frizzy, the Frizzy is not an, uh, a standalone document. It only works in conjunction with UK GAP. And if we throw away UK GAP, well, then it's only a matter of time hmm. before we throw away the Frizzy. We talked briefly there about the, the smallest of companies. And this is another change which is coming in. And I, I'm always struck by, with accounting and auditing particularly, that um, was it 10 million euros now is, is when we cease to be a small company? Is 10 that? million euros is coming in next year. Yeah, so turnover of 10 million euros is, is small. anything above that and you're, you're, you're big. <laughs> but if my company only has 10 million euro turnover, we're pathetically small. Uh, it's always a strange test, but actually they're bringing a whole new level down at the bottom. Um, so instead of having SMEs, we're going to have, well, as well as SMEs, we're going to have MEs, uh, yes. micro entities. Micro entities. Micro entities, micro companies. Uh, perhaps we can focus on micro entities would encompass LLPs and even unincorporated businesses of, of, of a, uh, a particular size. But a micro company, the EU have determined, uh, is a company that has turnover of no more than 700,000 euros. So we really are talking small. 700,000 euros would be about 560,000 pounds at uh, 80 pence to the euro. So 700,000 euros. Uh, turnover, 350,000 euros gross assets and no more than 10 employees. So when we bring this into the Companies Act, we will convert those figures at the current exchange rate uh, into pounds. At, at 80 pence to the euro, it would be, the government suggests, about one and a half million companies here in the UK. Mm. And to put that into context, there are only about 1.6 million small companies who are eligible to use the frizzy. So of those 1.6 million small companies, 1.5 million would be very small, micro-sized companies. Um, and what the EU are planning for these micro-sized companies, again, because they're desperate to cut costs, is to say to them, you don't have to produce accounts anymore that show a true and fair view. It's a big step for the EU to take. You don't have to follow accounting standards anymore. You don't have to follow any accounting standards, not international ones, not the frizzy, nothing. Um, wow. They will be able to follow, as the EU call it, a very simple system of financial reporting. So it's not quite cash accounting, though, is it? It's sort of a step away from cash it's a, accounting. It's a small step away from cash accounting. The EU have clarified, you know, we did not mean cash accounting. And cash accounting cannot be used by companies as far as the EU is concerned. But what they can use is what they're now calling a simplified accruals basis. And bizarrely, a simplified accruals basis is like the accruals basis, but without the accruals. <laughs> so literally, we have no accruals, we have no prepayments, we have no provisions, but we do have debtors and creditors. So because we buy and sell on credit, says the EU, then we should reflect that in our accounts. So we will reflect debtors and creditors in our balance sheet, but we wouldn't reflect accruals and prepayments, we wouldn't effect, reflect provisions. Fixed assets will appear in the balance sheet of a micro-sized company, but there'll be no depreciation. The suggestion is that we'll just use the capital allowance in lieu of the depreciation. So it's just to keep it simple. Mm. But of course, we're actually sort of taking a step back to where we, what we were talking about before, and the idea that actually if we want to add value to what we're providing the client with, then in fact, we might not have a full audit, and it might in fact not even be the accountant's report we want, but we want to say to the client, look, if you have a set of accountant prepared accounts rather than simply chucking it all in Excel and seeing what happens, then you can go to the bank and say, look, you can trust us, we're pretty good. Yeah. And, and so I would hope that even those micro entities would still say, I'm going to use an account, I'm going to get the added yes. value that brings yes. because of the work they're doing. And, and certainly I would imagine mortgage lenders and HMRC and what have you will still be saying, well, actually, can we have a bit more backup to these numbers? Yes. Um, so there has, to be a, there has to be a likelihood that a lot of people will continue to use, I think, the profession. And 
I think that's right. Can, they would most likely continue to use accountants, and indeed they may well continue to use the accruals mechanism. Because, of course, as soon as you move away from the accruals mechanism, it's just a free-for-all. Mm. It is virtually cash accounting, uh, and I wonder if all businesses would wish to do that. And frankly, I wonder if banks would want to lend money to businesses, whoever prepares the accounts, if they're prepared on this bizarre near-cash basis. But I think we're going to see big, big changes coming up for anybody working in accountancy at the Substantial moment. Substantial so, changes right. for everyone involved in accounting, yes. Very important indeed. Now it's time for a section we're calling Guy's Notes on Notes. Each time we make a programme, Guy will take one note from a set of accounts and cover the main issues that people seem to face when they're preparing them. I'm going to talk this time about related party disclosures. What we have to remember, regardless of whether we're following the Frizzy or following FRS 8, is that there are six things that we need to disclose once we've decided that we've got a material related party transaction that needs to be disclosed. Those six things. Firstly, the names of the related parties. Secondly, the nature of the relationship between them. Thirdly, the amounts involved. Fourthly, any amounts written off during the year. Fifthly, any amounts outstanding at the end of the year. And sixth and final point, we have to disclose additional information, perhaps information that the transaction is other than on an arm's length basis. It's a simple checklist, really. Where many companies fall down is on the second of those six items. They fail to explain the nature of the relationship between the parties. So in a set of accounts, we simply have a transaction between the company and X Limited and plenty of information about the transaction, but who are X Limited? We need to have it explained to us that X Limited is a company owned by one of the directors, for example. We need to see why X Limited is related to the reporting company. Does it control the reporting company or is it controlled by it? Is it and the reporting company under common control? Does one influence the other? Does one party be subject to control and the other be subject to influence? We need to understand the mechanisms that cause parties to be related, and they are slightly different under FRS 8 and the Frizzy. But the key is, once we appreciate the relationship, to make sure that we disclose in the accounts for outsiders, for people who may not know anything about the company, why a particular transaction is being disclosed. So time and time again on, on certainly my courses, and I'm sure your courses mm. as well, um, and it's this interaction between what I do and what you do, the interaction between tax and accounting. And it's something that I always say to people, it, most of tax actually is just whatever the accounts say is fine with us. Yeah. Um, but there are some specific areas that in recent times have changed quite a lot, actually. And one of them, I know, is, is provisioning and how that all works. It's a big thing for people to watch out for, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um, I mean, I remember the days, uh, 70s, 80s, even through into the early 90s, when companies could provide for just about anything. Because as long as it was prudent, that was the driving force. You could do it as long as it was prudent. Um, and that was fine in the accounts. But of course, the taxman would say, I'm not going to allow that provision. You know, I don't see that that provision's uh, appropriate. Uh, and of course, we had many cases, didn't we, where uh, cases in the oil industry, cases in the airline industry, where, where provisions were, were challenged, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Everything changed then in the late 1990s uh, when we issued FRS 12 on provisions. Um, FRS 12 brought provisioning onto, a, I suppose, a conceptually sound basis for the first time. And what it said is, you can't provide for anything unless it meets the definition of a liability. You can't provide for something just because it's prudent. So, for example, if you knew that you would need to spend £100,000 on a piece of machinery in 10 years' time, you couldn't just provide 10000 a year and build up a provision and spread the cost because each year the £10,000 wouldn't meet the definition of a liability. So that basically stopped a lot of the provisions that many companies used and they did use them, frankly, to, to profit smooth, to smooth out the peaks and troughs in their reported results. Uh, the example I use in FRS 12 is aircraft being overhauled um, and the fact that the Civil Aviation Authority require the aircraft to be overhauled or else it can't fly. Well, FRS 12 says, well, maybe you don't want it to fly. Maybe you just keep it for spares. Maybe you turn it into a museum. There are always choices. So you still can't provide in advance of incurring the expenditure. 
So it completely stopped the, the profit smoothing process that was obtained via provisioning. So the first effect of that was that as soon as a company provided something, as long as it complied with FRS 12, then the revenue would say, well, that's fine. And all these challenges suddenly stopped. So that's a, FRS 12 is a good example of where um, a standard has come in which has solved the tax problem, if you like. But then you were telling me uh, before we started recording about something which I've not, not really come across at all, which is this idea of kind of a, a compound, a, a sort of... Um, planes always used to be the example we used, actually, yes. which was that you know, you, you depreciate your wheels over a different period from your engines and your wings and yeah. everything else. Yeah. But there's now a whole new area of, uh, in accounting which is going to cause a very important issue for taxation. Yes, yes. I mean, there's an interesting story behind that as well. So F FRS 12 destroyed traditional provisioning. It stopped companies building up provisions over time. And there was effectively a revolt. Some very large companies were suggesting that unless they had a mechanism to spread the lumpy charges that they, they were incurring, um, then they just wouldn't comply with the standard. So what we did is we created a second standard, FRS 15, on tangible fixed assets. Um, and it created this phenomenon called component accounting. Yeah, And what it would say is you can break down your major tangible fixed assets into separate components. So yeah, whether we're talking about a piece of machinery, uh, whether we're talking about a building where you might separate out the lifts and the, and the flat roof, for example, uh, fine, you can, you can do that. So the idea was that if you had material components that had significantly different useful lives from the life of the asset as a whole, then it would be worthwhile splitting them out and depreciating them over these shorter periods of time. Now what that would facilitate, let's take the example of a building, if you were depreciating the whole building over 50 years, but you were depreciating the lifts over say 20, then when you get to the end of year 20, the original lifts are fully depreciated and you're now gonna replace them. So in accounting terms, we would remove the cost and the accumulated depreciation of the lift we would spend money on the new lift and we would capitalise that expenditure. But if you hadn't used component accounting, if you just had the building as one figure being depreciated over 50 years, then 20 years in, the original lift is still in the process of being depreciated because it's being depreciated over 50 years. So what you would have to do is treat the cost of those new lifts as just a repairs and maintenance expense and charge it all at once. So to avoid that lumpy charge, you, you couldn't use a provision to avoid it. So the way you avoid it nowadays, the way we've avoided it essentially since the late 90s, is to use this phenomenon of component accounting. And that's fine. It does then spread the lumpy charges. But it has a downside because in that year when we spend the £100,000, if instead of charging it as an expense and getting the tax relief, we capitalise it, well, then we don't get the tax relief, at least not straight away. Um, it certainly wouldn't be treated as capital expenditure. The revenue would say, well, that's deferred revenue expenditure. For some reason best known to yourself, you have decided to take this expense and to defer it in the, in the balance sheet. Well, that's fine by us, they'd say, but we'll defer the tax relief as well. Uh, and so a company in that situation would get the tax relief as they were depreciating that component um, over years, I suppose, 21 to, to, to 40. So it's not a tax-efficient policy. It's not something that we would recommend companies to do if they were driven by um, saving tax. But if you were looking at, for example, a listed company or, or a family company that was gearing up to be sold or, or gearing up for going for a listing and wanted a nice smooth trend of profits, component accounting is a technique that can give them that smooth trend of profits but at the expense of tax efficiency. Mm. So as you say, that's the key point, isn't it? It's not as a tax efficient thing to do, but it would give the presentational aspect of the accounts, they would make them look nice and yes. uh, even over the years. It might make the company look more stable than it actually was. It could be quite a volatile company in terms of its performance, which might affect its value. Um, but if you can smooth out those peaks and troughs and make the company look more stable, then it might be considered to be more valuable. Yeah. So I, now would be a good time to do a little bit of counselling. Um, and what I would like to do is, there are certain things that, from a tax perspective, it's always very annoying that accountants out on the coalface, preparing accounts, doing audits and things like that, don't do. Yes. Um, and of course, it's the fact that you live in a wonderful world of materiality. 
uh, where we live in a wonderful world where everything has to be right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the point is things like, oh, well, yeah, they changed their car, but we didn't really think it was that important. Or, um, yes, they've had this loan go through and the, mo- the minutes don't show it correctly. All these things are very important from a tax perspective. I wondered if there was anything that, from an accounting perspective, you really notice as you go through files, whether it be payroll sections or deferred tax, you know, things that where the accounting uh, work would be a lot easier if the tax people did their jobs right. Oh, gosh. Um, I guess I, I guess one of the issues that uh, has been uh, has come to the fore in the last few years, uh, again, and it's back to provisioning again, uh, it's companies who, after the year end, decide that they're going to pay a bonus uh, to their directors or senior employees, um, and then they just accrue for that bonus. Well, of course... You could do that in the old days when you could just do it because it was cautious or prudent to accrue for things. But now, remember, you have to meet the definition of a liability. Um, And if the directors decide to pay a bonus after the year end, well, then obviously there was no liability as at the year end. And it would actually be wrong to accrue for that liability at the year end. Wouldn't stop a company from doing it because perhaps they wouldn't realise it was wrong and perhaps the auditors wouldn't pick up that it was wrong. But if HMRC were looking at those accounts closely, they would see it and they would raise a question. Well, I can see there's a provision here for a bonus. How was that established? When was that established? Um, And of course, what they're looking for is to see whether it was established as at the year end. And if a company says, well, we decided it in a board meeting after the end of the year, that's going to be disallowed. Mm -hmm. So I guess what a company is going to have to say is, well, hopefully because it's true, well, we had a meeting before the year end Uh, when we knew roughly what our profit was going to be, and we made a decision then as to how much we were going to pay, perhaps how much as a percentage. However much the profit is, uh, 80% of it will be paid out as a bonus. Um, And because they've made that decision before the year end, they would argue then, then, then they can justify accruing for it. The revenue in that type of situation, I suppose, would say, well, who was at this board meeting? Were the people who were going to receive this bonus at the board meeting? Well, no because they're not directors. Well, then you haven't created the obligation. Mm. Ah, says the company, we forgot to tell you, we told everybody immediately after the board meeting by sending them an email, we've just had a board meeting and we've decided that whatever the profit is, we'll pay out 80% as a bonus. Job done. Or we put a notice up on the employee notice board saying, you know, we've had a board meeting um, and we've decided to pay this bonus. If there was one tip that you would offer to people working in the profession today, what would it be? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, I guess what I'd say is because certainly under UK GAP and also under IFRS, we, we nowadays have a principles-based system. There isn't always one right answer in terms of accounting. There isn't necessarily one way to account for something. We have to reflect the substance of the transactions when we account for something, but two accountants might not agree what the substance of the transaction would be. So, I suppose what I'd say is something that Sir David Tweedy said to me many years ago, which was, don't start with a clean sheet of paper and work forward and see where you end up, because you might end up in the wrong place. Decide where you would like to end up. Decide how you would like to account for something for whatever reason, because it's tax efficient or likely to be tax efficient, because it gives you the kind of profit figure that you want, whatever it might be. Decide where you would like to end up and then work back from that and see if you can justify it. But I would have to say, to the extent that you can't justify it by a fair application of the principles in the standard, then you have to change. You have to change what it is that you're trying to achieve and, and try and come as close as you can to what you want to achieve. If you jo- go over the line and actually ignore the fact that you can't justify what you want to do, then you've become a creative accountant um, and that could be, there could be consequences. Now it's time for our technical briefing section. Each programme, Guy will take an area that's of particular concern out there in the industry and try and help if he can. This time, it's accounting in the recession. There are three issues I wanted to draw your attention to as regards accounting in a recession. The first concerns impairment reviews. The second, the accounting for upfront arrangement fees when entering into financing agreements. And the third, the classification of post-balance sheet events. So the first of those issues was impairment. What I wanted to draw your attention to was that obviously we're doing a lot of impairment reviews because of the downturn, because of the recession. But an impairment review performed for a small company 
in accordance with the frizzy is different from an impairment review performed under FRS 11 or indeed IAS 36 uh, for a larger company. If we're doing an impairment review for a larger company, we're going to be looking at forecasting to perpetuity and discounting back to present value using weighted average costs of capital. For a smaller organisation, that could be difficult, that could be expensive. And the Accounting Standards Board, who were, were responsible for the frizzy, didn't want to impose that kind of burden on the smaller company. So they created a series of requirements where the word impairment doesn't actually feature anywhere in the standard practice section. What they do in the frizzy is focus on the carrying amount of fixed assets. And they ask us to establish whether or not that carrying amount is recoverable. We don't forecast, we don't discount, or at least we don't have to. What we do instead is we think, well, what would the depreciation charge be? And is there enough profit or enough cash to absorb that depreciation charge each year? That's how we used to do it in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, before the standard on impairment and the frizzy even came into existence. So impairment reviews necessary under the frizzy, but potentially much simpler so as to be flexible and less of a cost burden to the smaller business. The second issue I wanted to draw to your attention was the accounting for arrangement fees in financing agreements. Guess what? what we need to be careful about here is that businesses may not be able to obtain finance from the usual sources, from the local bank. Maybe they need to go elsewhere. Well, maybe they're going to have to pay more for the finance if that's the case, but they might also face slightly unusual terms, perhaps in particular very large upfront arrangement fees. It might be very tempting to think that it would be acceptable, dare I say prudent, to write off those upfront arrangement fees as they're paid against the profits for that particular period. The problem is that would be wrong. It would be wrong under the frizzy and it would be wrong under the mainstream system, FRS 4 and FRS 25. Indeed, it would be wrong under international accounting as well. What we must do is spread the finance charge. That's the interest and the upfront arrangement fee. We must spread it appropriately over the term of the loan. So what that would mean is not charging the arrangement fee straight away, but deferring the arrangement fee by holding it in the balance sheet. We could do that by deducting the upfront fee from the gross proceeds of the loan and showing the net proceeds of the loan in the balance sheet, or we could simply show it separately as a prepayment and then release it gradually over the term of the loan to top up the interest charge in the subsequent periods. The danger with writing it off straight away is that because it doesn't comply with the accounting standard, it can be challenged by the revenue. And if it was challenged, it would be challenged successfully. That means it would be disallowed immediately, allowed in subsequent periods. But there would also be the referral through the gateway, which might get the company into trouble in the future. Third and final issue to draw to your attention, the proper classification of post-balance sheet events. This isn't new. We know that we have to distinguish between adjusting and non-adjusting post-balance sheet events. We appreciate that adjusting events affect conditions existing at the balance sheet date. Non-adjusting events don't. Let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say, typical in a recession, sadly, a client's customer goes bust and we find out about it after the year end, post-balance sheet event. If the client was in difficulties as at the year end, then that's an adjusting post-balance sheet event. But if they weren't in difficulties as at the year end, but some disaster befell them after the year end, well, that would be a non-adjusting event. That's why it says in FRS 21, the mainstream standard, that a business going bust after the end of the year is usually an example of an adjusting event. Usually, because if it's gone bust after the end of the year, it was probably in difficulties at the end of the year. And it's reasonable enough to assume that unless we have evidence to the contrary unless we know that that business wasn't in difficulties at the year end, in which case we can't treat it as an adjusting event. The company loses just as much money, but that loss won't be charged in the first period, it'll be charged in the second period. If we charge it in the first period, then we are not complying with the standard, and once again, the revenue, if they challenged, would be successful. Another example, I don't want to be a harbinger of doom, but if, for example, the euro collapsed 
and we were looking at a company that had many European customers who were invoiced in euros, well then that company is going to lose money. Those euros are going to be worth less money after the euro has collapsed. But if the euro collapses after the year end, then that's got to be a non-adjusting event. Again, it's one of the examples in FRS 21. Exchange rate fluctuations taking place after the end of the year. The company loses money, but we can't go back and provide for it. We can disclose it in the accounts, but to provide for it would be wrong when it's a non-adjusting event. And again, opens the company to criticism and challenge. So that's three areas I've drawn to your attention. Firstly, impairment reviews and the difference between performing such reviews under the frizzy and using mainstream accounting standards. Secondly, the unique problem and very topical problem of large upfront arrangement fees and the fact that we mustn't be excessively prudent. And thirdly, the problem of post-balance sheet events and the proper classification of those events between adjusting and non-adjusting events. Well, that wraps up this episode of Accounting TV. Hopefully useful, hopefully covered the various bits and pieces that you hoped it would. You can get in touch with us, question at accountingtv.co.uk, and our next programme will be in the spring. But until then, bye-bye. Bye-bye.